This is slide two uh, in our 1920s unit. Big business, all right? Um, one of the reasons the 20s is roaring uh, is because people have a lot of money. Um, they're making more money than they've ever made before. Uh, we see the real rise of a middle class you know, for the first time um, as people are just, you know, they, they're getting out of living paycheck to paycheck. They have spending money. Um, so let's start there and talk about the economy improving. Um, it takes a little while, as we mentioned in the last slide, to get going, but once it does, the economy of the 1920s is the biggest economy the world had ever seen up to that point. Um, it's mainly due to several things. Um, very favorable tax policies from the government. Um, that help businesses and people make a lot more money than they've ever made. Um, new machinery, thanks to the Industrial Revolution, um, an abundance of oil, and the fact that we are building things with an assembly line. Uh, so lots of things kind of come together at once here to allow people uh, to have more money than they ever believed they ever could. Now, the problem is not, or at least for manufacturers, the problem is not with production, it's with consumption, getting people to buy goods, which brings us into advertising. Um, we really start to see a new industry here. Um, as businesses will hire people to convince others to buy their products. Um, advertising becomes a big business, big money. Um, Advertisers convinced people that they had to buy something. It's not just that you may want this. It's that you have to have it. Everybody has one of these. If you don't have one, you're going to be this social outcast, right? Um, so advertisers convinced people that they needed things. Um, one name in particular here you're going to need to be aware of was an advertiser, a man named Bruce Barton. Um, and Barton writes a very influential book about advertising. Um, it's called The Man Nobody Knows. The Man Nobody Knows. And in The Man Nobody Knows, Bruce Barton makes an interesting claim. Um, he argued that the greatest advertising man of all time was Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the greatest ad man of all time. And the, the basis of his argument is that Christ took 12 men from the lowest ranks of society um, and forged them into an organization that conquered the world, Christianity, right? Um, he takes 12 men from the lowest ranks of society, the, the disciples, right? Um, tax collectors, fishermen, carpenters, things like that. Um, and through those 12 men, he manages to, to form an organization that takes over the world, that's the power of advertising. That, that's what Barton is arguing. Um, and not only uh, is advertising convincing you that you need to buy things, once you've been convinced of that, now you've got to figure out how you're going to buy these things. Well, businesses are offering you new ways to purchase things. No longer do you have to have the entire purchase amount up front. Right? Um, they allow you to buy on credit or buy in installments. It's called an installment plan or buying on credit. Let's say you need a new refrigerator and a new refrigerator costs you, I don't know, $200, but you only have $50, but you need your refrigerator now, right? So you go to the store and they say, fine, fine, give us your $50 uh, and you pay the extra, you pay the, the $150 that's left a little at a time each month. You give us $10 a month over the next 15 months. And, and now, there's a catch. There's always a catch. The catch to buying on credit or buying in an installment um, is that for the convenience of taking home today what you really haven't paid for yet, for the them letting you take your refrigerator home after only paying $50 for it, they're going to charge you extra. They're going to charge you interest. So maybe you ultimately end up paying $250 for 
for your $200 refrigerator. So the catch is credit, right? Um, they're going to charge you interest. That's how credit cards get you in trouble. You know, you pay for something on a, uh, on a credit card and you think, oh, I can, I can, I can afford, you know, $20 a month. But the problem is you buy 10 different things on your credit card um, and suddenly you don't owe $20 a month. You owe $200 a month and I don't, you, you can't come up with $200 a month. So um, buying on credit uh, is a quick way to build up debt and that's what happens to most of America. Middle and upper class start buying on credit and they really start buying things that they can't afford and that's going to come back to to bite us in the butt by the end of the decade. Now, the reason that people have so much money is because they have all these good jobs, right? And because they have all these good jobs, they have all this money to spend. The reason that they're able to afford to buy things is because we're building things in a different way now. We're building things on an assembly line, and that is known as Fordism. Henry Ford was the first to build, to mass produce something on an assembly line. And if you can make large quantities of something, what does that do to the price of it? It drives it down. Right? Think, you know, Costco, Sam's Club mentality, right? The more you buy of something, the cheaper it is. So the more automobiles Ford can make, the cheaper his cars become. Right? Now, this uh, pretty soon, everybody will build, be building things on assembly lines here. But Henry Ford is the first to do it. And the first thing he starts cranking off his assembly line is the Model T. Uh, and here you see an old Model, a version of a Model T. That's a later version. Um, that's a four-door there, a much fancier one. But uh, the Model T will become America's car, okay? Ford does not invent the automobile. What Ford does is makes it affordable. No pun intended there on his name. Ford makes the automobile affordable. Cars used to be toys of the rich. What Ford does is make them so that the average middle class family man can buy a car. Let me give you an example how cheap Ford can make these things. Um, the first Model T's to roll off the line in 1914, way back when, 1914, cost $850. That was a lot of money in 1914. Just 10 years later, you could buy a Model T for $290. The price drops from $850 to $290 in just 10 years, thanks to the assembly line. Um, so suddenly, any working man can afford an automobile. And because of that, the automobile becomes the king. Uh, the auto industry replaced steel as the number one industry in America. Um, and that's really due in large part to spin-off industries. Now, a spin-off industry is simply, um, it's an industry that starts growing because another one started growing. So, for instance, um, thanks to spin-off industries like uh, rubber. Right? Rubber started growing. Why? Because we needed tires for all these new cars Ford is making. Glass for the windows for all the new cars. Fabrics for the seats, the interior of all the new cars. Uh, service stations. Why do we need gas stations? Because we have more cars driving around. Uh, garages. More cars means more cars need repaired. Um, oil for gasoline. All these spin-off industries grow because the auto industry grows. So the automobile could not have grown without them, and they could not have grown without the automobile. They go hand in hand. Okay. Um, so lots of spin-off industries, thanks to the automobile. We also see road construction. Uh, boom thanks to the automobile. Um, suddenly, if you lived on a farm out in the middle of nowhere, you were connected to a city. Small towns got connected to cities. Farms got connected to small towns. So you could get 
from your farm out in the middle of nowhere, not only to the nearest little town, but to the nearest big city as well. Um, vacations. Suddenly, families took more vacations. Why? Because you had your own car. You were no longer tied to a railroad schedule. You didn't have to come and go as the railroad came and went. You could come and go when you wanted to. Uh, so the family would pile in the car and take off on vacation. So because of that, tourism industries expand. Visits to tourist destinations, national parks, explode in the 1920s and 30s. Not so much, early 30s. Um, but uh, we're, we're going to see lots of industries really boom thanks to the automobile. We also see consolidation possible. Consolidation means taking several things and making them into one, consolidating them. So a good example of this is schools. When you used to have lots of small schools, especially out in the country, um, you know, you, you uh, had lots of little schools because people lived a long way from them, so you needed lots of them. Thanks to automobiles and buses, uh, you're going to be able to take lots of schools and consolidate them into one. So you start getting bigger schools. Okay? Uh, same thing with churches. A lot of little churches start consolidating into one bigger church for an area. Okay? Now, safety uh, was not a concern early on, and it shows. You have a lot of first-time drivers um, because you know automobiles are brand new here to most of America. So you get a lot of first-time drivers uh, who don't know what they're doing. So safety is a pro is a, pro a problem. It's a concern. Okay? Uh, the one millionth American had died in an auto accident by 1951. So really you're talking just about maybe 25 years or so, uh, 25, 30 years um, of uh, driving. One million Americans dead. That's more than all Americans killed on battle, in battle in the country's history. You know? uh, so if you added up all the battlefields uh, of the America's wars to that date, you had more people dying in automobile accidents than in war, which is frightening considering the goal of war is to kill the enemy. The goal of driving should not be to, to you know, kill the other drivers. So safety is a concern. There was no such thing as seat belts or airbags or anything like that. These are these are, you know, heavy steel cars, um, with a lot of first-time drivers. Okay. Um, the automobile is de is blamed for declining morals in the country, especially of young people. Um, a lot of people blame the automobile. Um, as young people suddenly have had this newfound freedom that they'd never had before. You know, instead of spending time with the family, young people would take the car uh, and go out on a date with their girlfriend and do things in the backseat of the car that you probably shouldn't be doing in backseats of cars. Um, so I, I don't know if the automobile is completely to blame for this, but suddenly, uh, in the 1920s, um, uh, morals took a, a, a downturn, let's just say. You know, uh, I think it had a lot more to do with the fact that uh, alcohol was suddenly illegal and lots of people doing whatever they could to get their hands on it, uh, including young people. Okay, uh, last topic here, in the air. Um, airmail service becomes... Uh, commonplace after World War I. We have lots of trained pilots who come back from the war looking for jobs, something to do. Um, the government is going to put them to work uh, delivering airmail. Um, the first transcontinental route from coast to coast was established in 1920. So suddenly you could get uh, mail from coast to coast uh, there a lot quicker than you used to be able to. Now, we need to take uh, a little bit here, and it'll take a little bit because this is very important, and talk about uh, the biggest celebrity of the decade, the most well-known man in America, uh, perhaps the world, Charles Lindbergh. Okay? Um, Lindbergh, in 1927, um, created, completed a famous first here, accomplished it, 
Um, he was the first to fi fly, sorry, first man to fly solo, meaning by himself, nonstop, meaning just that, without stopping, um, from the United States to Europe, across the Atlantic Ocean. First man to fly solo, nonstop, across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, again, this is 1927. He will fly from New York to Paris. Uh, takes him just over 33 and a half hours. 33 and a half hours um, by himself. Okay. Um, here you see a, a picture of Lindbergh. Oh, here's the airmail picture. If you trust your mail to that there. Uh, but the bottom there you see Charles Lindbergh um, and his plane, the Spirit of St. Louis. If you've ever been to the Smithsonian in D.C., the Air and Space Museum, you've seen the Spirit of St. Louis hanging from the ceiling. Um, Lindbergh does this, he accomplishes this, uh, to win a contest. There was a $25,000 prize for the first, first person to be able to cross the Atlantic without stopping. Um... He believes he can do it, so he goes to some businessmen friends of his, wealthy businessmen, and says, look, I think I can do this, but I'm going to need a specially designed plane. Um, so he says, if I can, I'll split the prize money with you. So they agree to, to pay for him to design and build a plane, um, and these businessmen are friends of his in St. Louis, so he names the plane in their honor, the Spirit of St. Louis. That's where the, the name comes from here. Now, Lindbergh, uh, again, will take off from New York okay, um, 33 and a half hours, just 33 minutes, or 33 hours, 39 minutes, so just over 33 and a half hours. He will land in Paris. Now, you got to understand something. This is a, uh, uh, this is a, a very, very, very risky flight. This is a life or death flight. He's not simply going on vacation to Europe, right? Um, what you have to understand about his plane is, um, and this is not the final version of his plane, it would have a little bitty, itty bitty, teeny tiny window right here, and one on the other side as well. I'll show you a video in class that'll show you. Um, but this is a, a plane. The biggest problem he's going to have, other than, you know, falling asleep, uh, is weight. So they have to strip the plane down of basically everything. There's a seat right about here. There's gas tanks right here and an engine there. So you get an engine, gas tanks, and Lindbergh sits right about here, right behind where he's standing. So there's actually, the window probably is kind of right behind his shoulder right there. Um, but uh, they strip it down as much as they can for weight. Um, they can't afford a nice comfy, cushy pilot seat, so they put a wicker seat in. Uh, if you know what wicker is, a lot of rocking chairs are made out of wicker. It's kind of that straw that you weave in and out. Um, so it's a little wicker seat. He doesn't even he doesn't even have a parachute. Can't afford the uh, the weight because um, he realizes if he has to bail out over the ocean, he's going to die in the ocean anyway. So you might as well just die with your plane going down. Um, there's no windshield. There's no windshield on the front. They can't afford the weight for the glass. Right? There is a periscope that pops up out of the top here and looks over the wing. Right? Um, and that's how he lands and takes off with his little periscope. Um, otherwise, he flies completely by his instruments. Um, and he's alone for 33 and a half hours. He's awake um, a total of uh, over 50 hours. Um, between, you know, everything before he takes off uh, and after he lands in Paris and all that. Um, he, he tells us that he falls asleep a couple of times at the, at the controls, you know, because imagine you're in this plane, just you and nothing else, no sounds, no one to talk to. He doesn't have a radio. Um, again, they can't afford the weight and plus the distance to, you know, communicate. So, um... He, uh, he, imagine you flying along in the plane, just you and your engine, and all you hear is, e and so on, for 33 and a half hours, right? Um, and he nods off a couple of times, and 
you know, he the plane starts to go into a dive, and he hears, and he wakes up, and he's like, oh, crap, oh, my God, you know, and he pulls out of the dive before he crashes into the ocean. Um, but uh, boredom has to be, you know, a, a problem. Um, he doesn't take food with him that I know of, not much, because uh, you eat a lot, then you got another problem, as you can imagine. Um, he takes water with him to drink uh, to stay hydrated, but then you got to pee. Um, so, you know, into a bottle and right out your little window there. So, um, this is a, a life or death flight. Now, they don't make him do it again coming back. They put his plane on a ship and he sails back. Comes back to be to the, the greatest, the biggest ticker tape parade um, the United States had ever seen down in New York City. Uh, the biggest hero America had ever seen. Charles Lindbergh, uh, nicknamed Lucky Lindy uh, for his accomplishments.